Welcome everyone to the second season of Fresh Air um, with our awesome team of pulmonary pathologists. Um, uh, so we have um, on my left here, Raghav, and we have uh, um, uh, um, uh, Rini Sansano on my right, and Sanjay Mukhopadhyay down at the bottom there. And so today we're gonna do something really cool. It's um, back to school time. And so we're gonna go back to basics of pulmonary pathology. Um, and uh, um, uh, Irene has some awesome cases for us to go through so to review some of the basics of pulmonary pathology, so take it away. Hi, this is our first case. is a, a male, 60 years old, that has a mass in upper left lobe. This is a, a percutaneous biopsy. It's a biopsy that they, they take in radiology. As, as you see, there is a needle shaped. We see here lung parenchyma, this thing that looks like fibroblastosis and it's it, it's normal in, in upper in upper low. And we see also this thing here it's a, a tumor. What do you think about this tumor? For me, this is squamous just on the h &E alone, unless there's some surprise somewhere else. Why, why do you think it's squamous? Because so of... Can we go a little higher on the... Yeah. Yeah. So here on the, on the right side, you see the sort of nest, but here on the, the portion that you're focusing on, I think is just a focus of keratinization. Okay. You know, with these very pink cells. Okay. Cells with abundant cytoplasm. I really like the the morphologic finding of cells that have relatively little cytoplasm, like there are on the right, and then the cytoplasm keeps increasing as you go towards the left. I think that's a very good sort of um, marker of squamous differentiation. A guys. corneal pearl is forming here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I tell residents to not to look these pink cells too much because. Uh, necrotic cells can be this, this look this this keratotic, so I I, I pay attention to. Uh, you can see my my arrow. Do you can I see? Can. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I pay attention also to these uh, intercellular bridges. I know Sanjay doesn't like much the intercellular bridges. <laughs> 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 I say that these are more reliable than than the the pink cells, but. And I, I like the whole keratinizing thing. So this is um, a yeah, scanner cell Matt, what, do you, how, what would you do with this? Would you, how would you approach this? So I, I agree completely. It looks like a squamous cell carcinoma. And so I, I don't think this case needs stains, um, but it's, um, you know, if one were to do stains, it would, it would be a very small panel, right? Of a P40 and a TTF1. I'm here, but um, and you want to explain, Matt, to my first year resident, why you didn't do the stains? Like, why this is squamous? What? How would you explain? Yeah, so it's got clear squamous differentiation, and I think we were uh, just describing the, you know, this dyskeratotic cells, you know, the intracellular bridges um, for what that's worth, and then the absence of glandular differentiation. Um, if I did see an area that had more glandular differentiation or potential glandular differentiation, then I would do the stains and. Um, cause, cause that's, if there is an adeno component, then you're going to want to do full biomarker testing as well on it. Right. And so, um, I have a low threshold for ordering the stains just because the, the testing is different, um, for this, cause this case, I would just order PDL one for biomarker testing and not do the full, um, uh, NGS panel for all the fusions and dry mutations. If it's, um, not, if it's, yeah, so I completely agree. Um, I do stains uh, when I feel that it's a variant of squamous cell carcinoma, something like um, not a classic look of squamous cell carcinoma, like all the features, how everybody has described so far, um, like a pseudoglandular squamous cell carcinoma, something like that, then I would do stains. Otherwise, I rely on histological features and try to sign it out. And get a PDL one, and like Matt mentioned, if there's an adeno component, uh, I will save the tissue for molecular testing. Um, otherwise, unless it's like a variant, more clear cytoplasm, like a clear cell variant of squamous cell, unless it's a variant, I would just go straight away diagnose it. But 
there was also I also was interested to see the rest of the uh, needle core biopsy. There was some uh, pale basophilic areas in the background, so I was curious what Irene has got us in store. Well, first here, uh, I want to say that I find uh, that for residents difficult when I show these like these kind of glands that are not glands are entrapped epithelia, but this can make uh, people think that this is an adenoid and this is totally benign. Uh, yes. Can you show it in a little bit higher, Mag, and that will be really good for residents to see what that this? is like. If, oh, at high Mag, the entrapped uh, epithelium, yeah, yeah, like this. Yeah, that's a great point. I also feel that not just residents, I think a, a pathologists also get misled by this. The, um, we say residents. This is a glandular. We are we said residents when we want to say this is a pretty obvious thing for lung pathologists, but for residents, <laughs> and we, and we say so. But but many people can can confuse this, even even lung pathologists at, at I, some at yeah. some setting. I, I think it, it gets tricky too, especially when you do the stains in these cases, right? I think that that because you'll see some TTF one positivity intermix, right? Very and high the, and very big in the stains. Right, yeah. absolutely right. And and then I think that's the other pitfall where um you you know you then want to call it adenosquamous when it's just it's picking up the entrapped pneumocytes um in the middle of the lesion. Um, I, I, yeah, our... that's what I was going to say, um, Matt, when you said you do stains if there's a glandular component. And to my counter to that would be why would you do it if there's an obvious malignant glandular component? Uh because if your stain is you know because the stain really doesn't help in that situation. Like you're you're already convinced that there's an adeno malignant component and a malignant squamous component. So you have an adeno squamous carcinoma. In a thing like this, where you have a benign entrapped component, you can actually be misled by doing the stain because you'll be TTF positive and you might think, hey, that confirms my diagnosis. So actually, it's a, it's a little tricky if you have a glandular component, whether you whether the yeah. stains help in any way or. Yeah, I, I completely see what you're saying. Um, I, I guess it's more helpful if it's a potential poorly formed glandular component, not just pass an eye throughout, yeah. right? You know. So, Raga, you, you take me to where you said it was. Uh... I think the basophilic areas right here. Um... Here? Yeah, r stop right there. Yeah. Are lymphocytes, aren't it? Or this is a vessel. Yeah, just the background was a little funny looking because it has got more elastosis in the background. I think it's the, oh, from the, apic the, stroma, the apical uh, cap. Like the, the stroma, okay. yeah, yeah. Yes, the like here, I think we are in the apical cap. Yes. Mm. And maybe the, yeah. the carcinoma has appeared there. Exactly. So the stroma here is pale, basophilic, little bit of amphophilic kind of appearance. But if you go to the areas where the nest of squamous cell carcinoma is present, in that, the background is more slightly more basophilic, maybe a little more, more mixed blue, white matrix. Yeah. yeah, more blue. Yeah, infiltra infiltrative. Yeah. yeah, maybe there's a component of stromal desmoplasia coming in, which correct. makes correct. it bluer. I'm not sure why it's a little bit more blue. It is yeah, it, it's different. exactly at the infiltrative area. So I, I agree with Sanjay that it might be the desmoplastic reaction giving that uh, little more color to the mm -hmm. To the 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 fibroelastosis in the background. Okay. Actually, I had some keratin here, but I this cut <laughs> got got folded, and but here we can see keratinized epithelia. We can move to there. Yeah. And one more thing, I'll add, uh, Irene, if you could just bring it to any one of the tumor nests. Just focus it on any one of the tumor nests. I um, just bring it to the center of the field. I would say that for a like for a beginner in lung pathology, it's important to know that unless it looks clearly squamous, which it does in some areas here, it's not a bad idea to do the stains because solid things like this can also be solid adenocarcinoma. Um, so that's really the decision you have to make. Is, is it clearly squamous on the HNE and you don't need to do stains? Or are you not sure and then do the stains, TTF and P40? Because the, the differential here is a solid variant of adenocarcinoma. But like like we discussed in this case, it's I think we are all on the same page that it's not that's really not an issue here. Es, es que most, uh, carcinomas are P40 positive, mo, uh, all of them, so or almost all of them. So it's very few uh, immunohistochemistry that you have to do. So be sure to 
to make this diagnosis quickly. So I okay. have a question. Uh, when do you do music Armin? Do you do it at all or do you just take it out? You just do TTF1, P40, basic two stains like everybody recommend or if at all, yes. is there a place for doing music Carmen? So my, my take on that is rather that when there is significant mucin, so enough mucin that you can call something an adenocarcinoma, that mucin is usually visible on HNE clearly. And when there is not significant mucin, so when there is, you know, you're really struggling, is that one little blob, a mucin blob, even if you find that that's music Armin positive, it, usually you, you're still in doubt whether this is significant or just an entrapped gland or some sort of a bronchial epithelium. So I don't, in, at least in my bias, I don't find doing music Armin is really helpful. But I, I do know people who do, do music Armin stay even in the current day and age. So it, it's, you know, it, I think it's a matter of personal preference whether you do music Armin or not. Yeah, I find it I... difficult to interpret. Yeah, that's that's the most important point, especially on the needle core biopsies. I don't even think about doing music Armin on resection specimens. Only if my colleague mentions about music Armin, I'll bring it in. Otherwise, I'm happy to forget about music Armin. Agree. Yeah, remember, I mean, the one thing for first years to remember is that music Armin is not only positive in tumor cells. It can also be positive in, you know, uh, goblet cells in the bronchial epithelium and, you know, other cells here and there in slight blushes. So just because something is music Armin positive does not necessarily mean it's uh, adenocarcinoma. That's a great point. Great point. We move to the, um, the second case. It's a woman, uh, 60 years old, and he has she has a mass in upper right lobe. And uh, can, I, can I just say that your scans are absolutely beautiful. These are just so clear and you. easy to, to see. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell to the technicians. <laughs> they did the work. Um, the, in this case, the, the patient has uh, uh, images of dissemination. He has lesions everywhere. Because mm -hmm. you said you, you, the, you will do, you would do um, PDL1 in the other one, but if it was going to to be resected also? You you are doing biomarkers in all the cases? Yeah, and that's just how it's funded in Ontario. We, we, we reflex biomarker testing on every new newly diagnosed lung cancer, regardless of stage or anything. New diagnosis, not that you do in every sample. Because some, some, mm -hmm. some yeah. people think when they say reflex, they, they say, no, we, there is the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, adenocarcinoma, and we do NGS. Let's say this is doing NGS in multiple samples. Sometimes. Oh no, 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 no. We, we, that, that that would be a large waste of money, right? They, they would. It, it, the only time we would repeat is if it fails, right? So sometimes it fails on our small biopsies if there's not enough tissue, and then then we'll repeat it on a resection if if one is done. No, I say it because people think that that when they say reflex that. Uh, no. You are not going to that. It was going that it is going to be easier that you don't have to check the history if, if mm. it's done in. But but you have to check something that if, if it's done if it's a new diagnosis yeah. you have you have to do some work also. It's not automatic. Yeah. Okay. Yes, correct. No, I don't think that reflex. At least we don't interpret the meaning of reflex to mean that you don't think at all. You know, you. <laughs> I think reflex means that the pathologist does the ordering instead of the clinician. But yeah. This is a made up. Uh, uh, definition because reflex means automatic or unintended. Yeah, right. yeah it's it's a, a it's a reflex. Yeah, it's a pathologist reflexes, okay. uh, not others. <laughs> so here we have this biopsy where we can see these um, atypical cells that, in my opinion, here are in normal parenchyma maybe, but here we can see some desmoplasia, or maybe we see desmoplasia everywhere, and this is, look like malignant glands, gland forming, in my opinion. Agree. Also, yes, this agree. clearly malignant adenocarcinoma. So the, the, um, in, in our case, I don't do any immunostochemistry in this case, if the, um, history is that clear that the patient has a lung mass and doesn't have anything anywhere. I'll go for 
NGS and, and PDL1 in this in this case. But yeah. you said this is disseminated, right, uh, Irene, or did I understand that wrong? Disseminated. That clinically... hmm. that, that's why yeah, I'm not so doing... So what does that mean? Multiple lung nodules, or how, how do we know that this is... No, that has lymph nodes and maybe a lesion mm -hmm. in the liver or in the... Or whatever. Oh, so I see. It... But clinically, lung cancer... Clinically, a big mass in the in the lung and no history of anything else. Some lymph. Of anything, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. agree. I, at least my my also um, approach would be not to stain this and to to save it for molecular. This is a very quick diagnosis. You have you the yeah. diagnosis was taken yesterday and you have the diagnosis uh, today, uh, very early because we we label this. Um, important or we label this kind of biopsy so we we know very early that this patient has adenocarcinoma and we can start everything yes so yeah. irene i think uh, we should have a little discussion on why we think this is malignant for the first year residents why okay. this is malignant and why we do or do not stay with tts1 i mean that's a very long discussion but at least the malignant discussion we should have now raga can you explain to the pty ones why this is malignant yeah, so um, I can try. So basically, we have um, atypical glands, irregular growth uh, pattern. Most of them seem to be asinar because they've got this tubular or elongated glands with surrounding stroma. Uh, but if you see the overall growth pattern, they've got this irregular appearance and infiltrative kind of appearance, infiltrating into the surrounding stroma. And if you zoom into the individual cells in those glands, they have uh, significant cytologic ATP uh, in terms of different sizes and shapes of the nuclei. And many of them has got irregular nuclear membrane and prominent nuclei. And the cytoplasm seems to be on the moderate to uh, less amounts uh, compared to the nuclei. Uh, and also if we look for it, we might find some mitosis as well. Uh, because of the features, or no, it depends. It depends on on your approach to mitosis. <laughs> <laughs> depends on the thousand, depends on the thousand mitosis project. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, because of the following reasons, I do think would be uh, the features uh, on the HNE stain to call it as adenocarcinoma. Again, the biggest one is the glandular pattern. What it's exhibiting with cytologic ATP. Why we call this adenocarcinoma. Yeah, Matt, what do you think? So what, what are your criteria for calling this malignant? Sorry. So I, I, I agree completely and I- um... I wanted to show you again the, the non-malignant mm -hmm. glands we saw before. Yes, for comparison, yes. Comparison. Okay. So, so it's a very round, not infiltrative appearance. The, they're, they're largely maintaining their polarity and um, they're spacing with one another. I find the spacing is very helpful. They're, they're very- um, they're they're nice and orderly fashioned. It's like you know when you go like in, during COVID, we had all those spots on the floor that you had to stand six meters apart. It's like the cells are all behaving themselves and standing six meters apart from one another, right? And uh, you know, and the the tumors just don't respect their neighbors and just are all jumbled up. And so I find the spacing yes. helpful as well. And, and I noticed that in your description, Raghav and Matt, that nowhere did you say that this is TTF one positive. That's why it's an adenocarcinoma. So the whole distinction of malignant versus benign is all HNE, correct? Am I? Yeah. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. <laughs> Which is really the the most difficult thing that people struggle with is that when when it's so obvious, like in this case, it's pretty easy. But when it's less obvious, people struggle a lot and they try to uh, get assistance from a biomarker, which really does not help you in this situation. I don't know if, if you guys agree with that statement or not. I, I agree completely. The, the other thing I find people sometimes struggle with is um, on biopsy struggling to say if it's lipidic or invasive. Um, I, I don't know what people's thoughts are on, on, on whether you even comment on that in a biopsy. Um, yeah, I know we are slightly different in that situation, but I don't. I don't because I feel that firstly, it's very difficult to tell, you know, in some cases. So in some cases, it's easy to tell what the growth pattern is and some cases it's difficult. And second, I think that there people greatly overestimate lipidic growth pattern on biopsies. Um, and third, whatever growth pattern you give on a biopsy, on resection, something else can always uh, appear. So I feel it's very misleading 
to say that something is something predominant on a corneal biopsy when on resection everything can change depending on, on another area. But rather when um, Irene, I would like to hear how you approach that. Do you mention growth patterns and why? I used to because it's it's written in the blue book that we should list the the patterns, but I think it's useless uh, in, in the in the case of biopsies because you you won't do anything different because of the patterns, uh, so it's a lot of work for for nothing. Yeah, I I agree. We don't mention the growth patterns only. Um, only um, scenario would be when we have very few cells, uh, tumor cells, otherwise mostly it's all related lung parenchyma or fibroelastosis, but very limited tumor cells. And if they are demonstrating, if we think that it's in lipidic growth pattern, then we try to mention that this might represent lipidic growth pattern and this may be any of this adenocarcinoma in situ or minimally invasive or invasive with lipidic predominance and uh, definitive classification or resection specimen. That's the only scenario we try to hedge, but otherwise we shy away from mentioning any growth patterns because at the end of the day, those things may become important on resection based on the new IASLC grading, but not on the needle core biopsy. If I'm going Great. to to do NGS, I, I have to say the percentage of tumor that I have here. How how much tumor do you would, would you tell? It's it's a challenge. We, we all know it, it. This is not a science. It's just a guess, right? So yeah, you know, I try to ballpark it. I'm like, is it half and half? In this case, I feel so. I'm trying to think, is it half tumor cells and half non tumor cells? or is tumor more than non-tumor? You know, I start with that and then I progressively refine my guess. So here I would say, uh, yeah, it probably is a, around half and half um, if you consider all the non stroms So maybe maybe 50% would be my guess here. It's, it's completely not a... non-scientific, probably completely inaccurate. <laughs> the, the point is we have to think on, only in the nuclei, nuclei, not in all the tissue. Yeah. No? So we okay. from the nuclei of these fibroblasts and vessels and lymphocytes, how much is? I maybe would say 40, 40, 35, something. I'm, I'm less generous yeah. than, than Sanjay. Yeah, and but I, I, what do you think? think? Yeah, I'm a little more conservative. Uh, like Irene was saying, I was exactly in the same ballpark, like 40%, 35, because I see a lot of lymphocytes. Uh, more nuclear material would interrupt, means it comes in way with the tumor purity when you're doing the uh, molecular testing. And also, I would find very difficult to mark this slide exactly where they want to capture the glands um, when they're You have to taking... put the whole thing in this case. Exactly. Uh, so when we are including the whole thing, you're including so much of non-neoplastic uh, nuclei, especially the lymphocytes and the stromal cells. So I'm more conservative on this. The tumor purity, I think I would be like 30 to 40. Maybe I think 35, 40. Again, it's subjective, like Sanjay was mentioning. Totally. Yeah, and I, I agree with you guys. I, I think I would macro dissect this case. So we actually, we circle and, and, and um, macro dissect most of our cases with our, our protocol. So I would probably take something. Oop, I drew it all over. But, yeah. uh, oh, this um, part is the more tumor. Yeah, and um, yeah. I think that it, as, as everyone said, the, the lymphocytes, they look smaller, but they have the same DNA content. So we tend to overestimate those. And um, um, in general, often it's, um, we overestimate the amount of tumor cellular there. I would macro dissect this part, so I won't macro dissect. I mean, because the only part I want to remove is this one. But I, yeah. I know I imagine there are different approaches for that. Yeah. Cool. Can we move to the next one? Yeah. Yes. This is um, okay. Ooh, I'm sorry. They're already done, so this must be complicated. Or not? Maybe it's very easy. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a 55 year old man with multiple pulmonary lesions and multiple lymph nodes positive. And we have a 
the it's a it's the lung it's a it's a biopsy of the lung it's very blue it's blue yeah, wow. with necrosis yes so for me at least Irene, can i give give you my impression go, or go do you ahead. want to go ahead so you know it's clearly malignant high grade carcinoma right there's a little azoparty effect on the right hand side so for me the di differential here is is this a small cell carcinoma or a basal large squamous cell carcinoma or or poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma and that's how i you know um, would approach this because um, this could easily be also a, a met from a high grade squamous cell from the tonsil or something like that and it could easily also be small cell carcinoma. So I would do the neuroendocrine markers, keratin, P40, TTF. That would generally be my approach. What is your panel, Sanjay? Which is that? Your panel, your immunostochemistry panel. Yeah, so in a case like this, it would be keratin, A1, A3, uh, uh, TTF, P40, uh, synaptophysin, chromogranin, INSM1. That's what I do as a standard when I'm, mm. when I'm suspecting small cell in the differential. I, I do seven cytokeratin. If it doesn't work, I go for, I don't know why. Sometimes cocktail, sometimes uh, seven. In this case, I did seven. This is, mm -hmm. I, I guess, the normal alveoli. And these are, are the cells. Mm, it's not membranous, but it's not neither dot or not perfect dot. Here we see some dots, but it's yes. in the middle of membranous. I feel that and dot. dot like thing is too much overemphasized in the literature and people, I, I, do, so I don't care whether it's dot like or not, just that the, the, it should show that the cytoplasm is scant, at least mm -hmm. for when looking at small cell. You know that the immunohistochemistry frequently supports your morphologic impression that there's very scant cytoplasm. So the staining is very minimal and delicate. Um, on a keratin stain, it doesn't. It's not always dot-like, and I feel that that idea that it has to be dot-like is is wrong. What do you think, um, um, Matt? What do you think about that? Okay. I agree. I, I think it's just exactly like you said. It just highlights the scant cytoplasm, and um, um, like it, it did typically doesn't look like the normal epithelium there, where you see it kind of surrounding the whole thing, but it doesn't have to be. Yes. So, Irene, if you can bring in the normal epithelium just to contrast, then we, this, for the students, it'll be great to see. What an amount of cytoplasm in normal epithelium on a keratin stain, yeah, like this, mm -hmm. versus the amount of epithelium on a, in a, you know, presumably small cell carcinoma on the left hand side. But uh, we don't that, know that for sure, right? We don't know I'm doing, now, now I only do two neuroendocrine markers, the chromogranin, that it's here, that this, this is very, very positive. This is diffusely positive, yes. but can also be focal. Uh, just like yes. synaptophysin, but be cautious with if it's focal because you have to have also the cytokeratin before calling something and a small cell only by a focal synaptophysin because many things stain focally synaptophysin. And I don't have the IMSM, but I did. Uh, now I'm doing chromogranin and um, insulin IMSM. And TTF1. You can see the azoparty effect even on the immunostain because there are yeah. little blood vessels with that deposition of the thing. Yes, you saw it that in that in the first one. I mean, I'm. Yeah, even here. That. So if you go to HiMac here, uh, Irene, there are some blood vessels that are floating off to the side, you know, with that little. Oh. I mean, you can't see it as nicely as on the HE, but you can see them here also. Okay. I, I think this is an important teaching point too with the TTF1 in small cell in that um, it, it's not necessarily means this is lung. Any small cell from any organ can express TTF1. It's just an aberrant expression of it. And so um, I, I sometimes see um, trainees, right, you know, consistent with lung origin when the TTF1 is positive. And um, I, 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 I don't get yes. that. But in case of carcinoids? Is in carcinoids, yes. Yeah. There it is, babble. Yeah, so the rule is if you have a low-grade neuroendocrine neoplasm, uh, or you know, epithelial neuroendocrine neoplasm, then um, TTF1 is a reliable indicator of lung origin, like in carcinoid tumors. But if you have a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, like a, like a small cell, then TTF is not reliable for lung origin because other things also do it: prostate, you know, esophagus, bladder, wherever can be positive for TTF1. I've even seen tonsillar 
one cell being positive for TTF. And, and yeah. other lineage factors can also be expressed like CDX2 and SAP-B2, like they, I think it's often called like this lineage factor in fidelity where they, they, they just start expressing different things. And so it doesn't mean it's not long if it even it's making SAP-B2 or something like that. Great point. Yeah, SAP-B2 especially is a, a notoriously overexpressed in small cell carcinoma. That's a great point. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So um, in this case, straightforward, you get the panel, it's it's just doing the way you're expecting, it's reading the textbook and it's worked out. What if the keratin is negative, the pan keratin or CK7 or keratin 7, what you've ordered is negative and the neuroendocrine markers are positive. TTF1 is positive. And again, Math made a great point that TTF1 positivity doesn't say the origin. So now we have a keratin negative, that is the first keratin what you have used, and then TTF1 positive, neuroendocrine markers positive. Now, would you still call it small cell or do you do more keratins or what? How? what is your approach? And when do you bring in KI67? So Raghav, in my experience, this is not a common situation. It's not common to have keratin negative. And I, remember I'm using a keratin A1, A3. It's very unlikely to be keratin A1, A3 negative but positive for the neuroendocrine markers. It's more likely to be actually the other way around, which is negative for the neuroendocrine markers, but positive for keratin. But in the situation you're describing, let's say hypothetically that happens, then I rely heavily on the clinical setting. So if it's a smoker with a higher mediastinal mass, you know, morphology is perfect for small cell. I, I might call it small cell, even based on that. If there's any doubt, if it's a younger person, the morphology is off, then I probably would not, and you know, then I might uh, repeat a keratin, do something else, investigate further. Um, but I, I feel that this is a not a common situation to have keratin negative, but neuroendocrine and TTF positive. What is Matt and uh, Irene think? I'll try with another, as I did CK7, I'll try with CAM 5.2, that is at least focally, I, I find in most cases, but if, if it's not with with all this panel, the TTF1, the neuroendocrines, I I wouldn't I wouldn't believe in one one marker. I mean, I, yeah. would, I would call it a small cell without the cytokeratin if this CAM 5.2 is, neg is negative also. Yeah, I use a pan keratin right off the bat. So it includes A1, A3 and a CAM. So um, with that, I, I get two keratins. Um, off the bat, and um, I have to say too, that's quite uncommon for that to be negative. And then I would probably um, make sure that it was nothing else as well. Um, it would be uncommon for a lymphoma or something like that to also abstain from neuroendocrine markers, but I would just take a step back for the um, with the immuno profile and make sure it's not a, one of the differentials of a small round blue cell tumor, like a lymphoma or a rhabdomyosarcoma or a melanoma or something like that. So um, depending on what else it was, I'd probably expand my immuno panel a little bit as well. Yeah. We I do the yeah. same thing. I combine a CAM 5.2 sometimes with the pan keratin because ours doesn't have the same thing as pan, uh, CAM 5.2, um, just to make sure that it covers all the keratins. And then if rarely it's negative with that. And I follow the same rules as Sanjay and Matt were mentioning. Uh, we all do immunostochemistry, we agree. Because it's supposed to be a nature yeah. diagnosis. I'm not that yes. brave. You know, I, I will confess. So sometimes, you know, you're in, on a busy day. This is the last case of the day or, you know, on a weekend and clinicians are looking for a quick diagnosis. Sometimes I will diagnose on, on h &E and do the stains later. I've actually never had, and really I'm using ne never in the true sense. I've never had a case where I called it small cell carcinoma on h &E and it turned out something else on the immunohistochemistry. So it's always been correct. Uh, so I think there are exceptions. You know, you can be wrong on H&E, but it's very rare. It's very rare to be incorrect on your H&E diagnosis. So I understand people, especially old-fashioned, you know, people who who trained in the pre minister chemistry era and who still feel that it can be made on H&E. I understand where they're coming from because it's very accurate. But still, I think people in our generation mostly do stay with, with the minister chemistry. And there, there are new diagnoses, just like not uh, neoplasm, and that can be that can look like uh, a small cell or so. 
Well, well, when do you guys do nut staining? Like when, when, when do you actually like, like what panel does it have to be staining for you to add a nut stain to your panel? Sorry? That's a great question, Matt. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Irene, you go first. No, I, I didn't understood the question, sorry. No, I, I was just asking when, when do you do the stain for nuts? Like what, like in what scenario, what oh. you know, profile, like when, when, when do you add that to your workup? No, and I have no idea. When they ask and, and the, the few cases I have, I have had is that they have this abrupt keratinizing that you see the, like a small cell and abrupt keratinizing. They are the, the, the two cases where I have, that I have picked. And maybe I should do all the schemas or the, all that look basaloid, I don't know, but I'm not doing it. And in the times I have done it in this camp in schemas, yeah, it has turned to be negative. So, yeah, I agree with uh, uh, Irene actually. So, you know, when it's morphologically clearly not, you know, when it's keratinized, has abrupt keratinization and so forth, I think it's a it is absolutely mandatory to do the stain when, when you know, it's so, for example, you have a young person a big mediastinal mass, abrupt keratinization, everything is great, nut is a great idea. But the idea that we should be doing nut in every poorly differentiated neoplasm, actually, I have been doing it on, on poorly differentiated neoplasms that don't fit. The yield is very, very low, I find. It's very, very rare for nut to be positive in those cases. So I, it's, uh, it's not very productive, I, I would say, to do it in those situations. But, you know, one good setting to do it is if your stains don't make sense or if it's a relatively young person, if there's a mediastinal mass, if the keratin is negative, you know, those odd situations, uh, I think nut is a good thing to do. Or if you're, you know, you have a discrepancy between P63 and P40, that's another kind of clue. But again, yield is very low to actually find a nut positive case. Yeah, agree. Agree with that. Yeah, for me, yeah, when something is odd, I look at the age of the patient. Uh, if it, I know the nut can happen in younger to older, like almost 70, 75 year old. So there's a wide, a wide age distribution of nut carcinoma. Uh, but when whenever I see a younger man, non-smoker, again, I don't know the literature if nut midline can happen in a smoker. But if a non-smoker, younger, and then like the stains doesn't make sense or doesn't fit together, like everything is so odd. So when I think it's an odd kind of scenario, that's when I do not. Otherwise, again, we don't have the stain enough, so we have to send it out. So I have to <laughs> carefully think about doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the key 67 here? Yes, I, I showed the key 67 that it's Crazy, crazy positive. What a shock, <laughs> right? I mean, I feel about the KI67 in a in a overtly high grade carcinoma. What is the point? You know, it's like, yeah. it tells you what you already know from the HNE. Is would you agree, Irene? Yes, in this case, it's because it's part of the panel. It it helps when it's uh, crushed. It's the 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 yeah. the use the big use of K67 is when it's crashed and you can see the the morphology well, it helps. Yeah, I, I, I do it only in selective scenarios, like when you have a small sample and you have the cells at the edge of the biopsy and they're all crushed. That's when I use K67, when I really want to differentiate from a carcinoid tumor. Otherwise, when you have acres and acres of land where you can see it's all high grade, I shy away or save money not doing KS67. It's a problem to do it because it has happened to me, this neoplasm with a low K uh, K67. So what? I, I said small cell anyway. Mm. So for what? Because sometimes it does, yeah. very, very few times, but sometimes it doesn't work or something happens and you find that there is no KI67 in this in this case. So yeah. what do you do? Yeah. You call it a small cell again. So for what? What's the point yeah. of that? I think people who use the KI67 tend to gloss over the technical problems with the KI67 or exceptions because, yes, it is true that, you know, small cells will be positive, or blazingly positive in most cases and carcinoids will not. But things in between will cause pro problems where there were no problems on the HNE. 
So you might actually create problems where there were none. But I would like to hear the other other side of this. So Matt, wh wh why do you do the K67, and do you ever encounter problems with with K67 interpretation? Yeah, so I, I I don't do it in all cases, but um, um, there's often a clinical um, request for it. I think some of the clinicians like to know what it is. Um, I think it gives them a sense of how fast it's growing, or I, I'm not sure how they actually change it, right? Because all small cells are really going to get changed and treated the same. But um, um, that's the one aspect of it, and uh, and I agree that the best use is in the small crush biopsies where you're you don't want to, to overcall a carcinoid, right? Because because that can happen, right? If you can't, yeah, I, I think you have to be really careful in your endocrine things if you don't see clear mitotic activity or necrosis. If you don't see lots of that in a small biopsy, I think a K67 is is mandatory um, before calling anything high grade because um, it's definitely a pitfall that you can. You think you wouldn't call a carcinoid small cell, but um, in limited tissue or, or in crushed, it is possible. This is a, a woman that has hemoptysis and a, a hilar nodule, a central nodule. What did you say, really? Hilar, no, one? central, central. I said re related to ili highly or ilium, I don't know the word, so better central. Oh, the hilum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hilum, Central, hilum. Yeah. Hilar sent, uh, nodule without any, any leaf node or, or, or images suggestive of metastasis. So we have this transbronchial biopsy where you can see the cartilage. You see also this. So any of you, if you want to, to tell what you see, I will go around. Yeah. Okay, can I go first? Go for it. Sorry, I'm always accused, as since my early residency days, of, of jumping to conclusions too quickly, but <laughs> I think that's just my, <laughs> my style. <laughs> anyway, the idea here is that, uh, to me, this is a clearly high-grade malignant neoplasm. Yeah. And there is a hint, to me at least, of slightly, you know, the cells are very poorly differentiated, or almost sarcomatoid looking. So my first thought here would be, could this be a sarcomatoid carcinoma? That's my first impression. I think this is clearly malignant. Um, you know, could it, it could also be a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Um, I think it's unlikely that this would be an adeno, but I my first thought would be to be a, get a keratin, a TTF, and a P40. And I think that will solve the issue. It, it probably is a squamous cell carcinoma. And my thought is that it might be possibly turning sarcomatoid in some areas. Uh, so that would be my plan, three stains. Anyone has another idea? Because I have two, only two stains. <laughs> I, I think there might be some dyskeratotic cells, but um, I don't think there's enough for me to not just call it on, on, on H and E alone. I would do the stains. Okay, Raga? Same, same, I will do the stains. There's some hint of squamous differentiation there. Otherwise, predominantly spindle cell or sarcomatoid features. Um, so it looks like we are dealing with a poorly differentiated um, malignancy. So I would do stains on this as well. This is TTF1. The cells are... Wow. The malignant Shot cells are positive. Yeah. Beautiful. And it, oh, I work with the A8. G7, mm. so it's highly specific. This is normal. This is the epithelium, and this is the, the TTF1. And the P40, it's highlighting basal cells. Wow. And the neoplasm negative. is negative. So this is Amazing. A, a good good reason to, to do immunohistochemistry. Despite we yeah. think that there are these keratotic cells and so, uh, I I I think it could be a pleomorphic one, but I didn't say that in this in this biopsy. I have a, a high tra threshold for pleomorphic in in the small biopsies, so I have to see something because yeah. sometimes I said pleo could be pleomorphic, and in the <laughs> the resection it comes that that it, there is not this uh, pleomorphic look anymore and maybe it's part of it, yes. I don't know. I agree. I agree. No, I agree with all of that. I mean, first of all, I agree 
that this is a great case to show how something can look squamous but actually turns out adeno solid adenocarcinoma. I think all of us were kind of <laughs> leaning in that direction. So that's a great one great point. The second great point is very easy to overcall sarcomatoid because it's very subjective, you know, in the eye of the beholder when something looks sarcomatoid. So I feel that there is a lot of variability in what looks sarcomatoid to one person and doesn't to the other. It, it might be that this is just high grade and that's why it looks funny. It's just a high grade body differentiated. Uh, well, a bit Christ also, or, or it, this, I guess it's a cryobiopsy because we do, well, but we don't see this artifact in cryobiopsies and talking. So, but but maybe this is artifactual, the, this elongated look. Yeah. That we see here is not real. It, it's yeah, some of it might be dermoplastic stroma with some spindle cells, I don't know. It, it's probably useful for trainees to, to mention what we would call it if it was just keratin positive, but negative for TTF1 and P40, which is can kind of be common in, in a poorly differentiated tumor like this. Yeah. So at least for my for me, this would be a in, in that scenario. So a malignant tumor that looks like carcinoma, keratin positive but negative for TTFP40, I'd just say poorly differentiated non-small cell carcinoma. And then in the comment, I say the, the current WHO term for this is NSCLC NOS, so not, not otherwise specified. Yeah, the yeah. other point I wanted to make is agree with that point. Um, when I have sarcometroid features or I'm thinking sarcometroid, I always add a pan keratin to see if those cells are staining with keratin versus mm -hmm. desmoplastic spindle cells or fibroblasts, which would not be keratin positive. That way I'm trying to match if the same cells are positive for keratin to make that comment uh, or at least raise the concern for a sarcometroid differentiation. Uh, in my comment, especially on the needle core biopsy, but otherwise when the TTF P40 both are negative, I do exactly the same as Sanjay just said. I do the same. And and then send yeah. this for molecular testing because a lot of these can have actually like met switching yeah. mutations, yeah. right? Even when they're sarcomatoid. And it's so important if yeah. TTF1 wasn't positive, it's so important to have the keratin because some things we we should. Uh, there, we shouldn't do a very large panel of immunohistochemistry. We should think in NGS, but a keratin is very important because there are some things that look like a carcinoma and are not carcinomas. Great. Yeah, a great, great case. Great case. One more? Yeah. Sure, sure. This is a 60 years old man with the mass in the left upper lobe. Again, if you, some of you want to make a mistake. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm saying it. I'm just saying it. No, please well, be I brave. Sanjay was. Okay, let me do. Okay, so for solitary lung mass, and that's what you said, right? Irene, solitary lung mass, and an elderly patient, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, if first you of think all, 60, 60 years old if elderly, this is elderly. Elderly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Soon I'm going to be 60 years old <laughs> in 10 years, and I'll be elderly. No, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> elderly meaning in the, in the appropriate age group for a lung in cancer. In the appropriate age group for lung cancer. Right. Very well said. <laughs> Right, so I think this is clearly malignant and is um, yeah. at least morphologically look very epithelioid and certainly good for carcinoma. Um, also, if, if you come down that path of small cell or non-small cell, this is clearly non-small cell. So I would be going down that path unless there's some uh, trick in the history. So unless there's a previous history of something else or there's a malignancy in the, in the uh, past, I would be going down the path of a uh, non-small cell carcinoma, and then I would also do the same thing as in the previous case. I would do a keratin TTF P40. The do you only do the, reason the, to the keratin always? If there's some difference in the clinical history. Sorry, do you do the keratin always, or because it looks a bit? Uh, it, yeah, it, no, your... I think it's reasonable to skip it here because it's so epithelial looking. But here, you know, one thing that's in the back of my mind is. 
and very weakly, not really strong, is, is SMRK4 deficient mm -hmm. uh, tumor. So the reason I say weakly is because those are, in my experience, more discohesive. But mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a rhabdoid look to some of these cells, so a keratin would be helpful in that situation. Yes. But I, I don't think... think that it has classic SMRK4 morphology. I agree. But okay. I did. I went for the non-small cell pathway. So this is TTF1. It's negative, but it has some things here that you could think that are entrapped or you could think that are part. If you think in what Matt said before, that cells are separate here are helping to say it's reactive. This is clearly reactive. I would say also hopna hopnail also mm -hmm. helps yes. for, for saying it's entrapped epithelia. So TTF1 is negative. Yeah, and, uh, okay, Natasha. Can I, can I make one more point? So the cells you are showing as reactive, if you look, compare the nuclear size of that with the tumor, it's much smaller, much smaller. Much smaller. So that also helps. I mean, I think that's really the most helpful feature for me is that those cells are much smaller than the uh, malignant cells. And the obnail <laughs> you're mentioning, it resembles like a Napoleon's hat. Uh, Natasha Reckman had that comment in our paper about the reactive nemocytes. Oh, this looks just like a little hat. This one. Yeah, it does. Yeah, very, very cute. Uh, P40 was my first panel. P40, clearly negative. Mm. Clearly negative. So, so uh, second, round. Yeah. second round, second uh, round, keratin. It's negative. Hmm. It's the plot smeller rat. Now, now it becomes a big issue. Now smart is This is not a gland. Issue. This is not a gland. It's necrosis. Because yeah. maybe it's you could think. Comedo necrosis. Comedo necrosis. No. Well, I did right. a lot of things. Also, as Mark, I, I I'll save you the amount of things I did. Here's napsin one. To ask you if you if TTF one is negative, do you do napsin A? No. No, I don't. No, I do. Some sometimes has it has helped me. Sometimes it has appeared positive, but in this case, it's on, only bothering or only confusing because there are some cells positive here and there, but I think are yes. no. Yeah, they are probably we, we, that, uh, Yeah, we have a dual stain, napsin and TTF one combination, so we mm. do that. <laughs> I did many, many, many immunohistochemistries, or many, too many for, for lung cancer. And I said, yeah. why not? Well, when you have something, think cytokeratin negative, why not one melanoma? And this yeah, is the melanoma. Shock 10. Green idea, great idea. Like, like great. a slap in your face, <laughs> melanoma. <Yeah. laughs> wow, Incredible. Wow. Yeah, and Melanin positive, and it, it really looked like a carcinoma. Also, to the their pathologist that I showed to her, she couldn't find any. Mm. She couldn't find any pigment, and she said it really looked like a carcinoma, but it was a melanoma. Yes. No history of yeah, melanoma. Well, you know, okay. Now that I'm I'm wrong, I let me just put in one more plug for differential. I think it's a good idea, although I didn't do it, that whenever you're thinking smart K4, also think of melanoma. Green. Because it's like, like, very, 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 like. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, the, 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 two melanomas I had, so the two melanomas I diagnosed in, in lung, they had no previous history of melanoma. Hmm. So it's yeah. a, a thing That's to have in our minds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of points yeah. I want to make. So the melanoma looks like your best guess, whatever your specialty you are practicing. For a breast pathologist, it looks like your high-grade ductal carcinoma. For a lung pathologist, it looks like non-small cell carcinoma. For a GI pathologist, it looks like a high-grade adenocarcinoma. So you doesn't matter which your practice you're doing subspeciality. It looks like your most familiar tumor to you in your specialty. That's the best thing about melanoma. The other day, Sanjay showed something on the Twitter where the melanoma was doing this lipidic mm -hmm. growth pattern. So it, it just, it makes you think that it is one of your familiar friends. So always, I always remember to 
follow the keratin pathway whenever there's a high grade, which I think I need to exclude other entities. It always starts with the keratin. So once keratin negative, then I fall into my path of adding well, four pack, the S100, in my case, or SOX10, then Desmin, SMA, and then keratin, which is the fourth pack of, because I don't have a six pack, so I start with four packs. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Have you heard last yeah. Shakira's song? The singer, Shakira? Yes. Shakira. Oh yeah, Shakira. Yes. I, I cheer you because you are a good actor. So the, the good, the good oh, acting, yeah. the melanoma yeah. is the good acting. So. Oh yeah. yeah. So it's a Shakira it of pathology? Later. Melanoma yes, is the Shakira of pathology? The Sha <laughs> Shakira's boyfriend or Shakira's husband in this case. <laughs> <laughs> great case great case thank you for sharing yeah well thanks everyone i think that uh, was a really great episode of, of um, fresh air hopefully everyone learned something and uh, stay tuned for some more exciting episodes for season two yeah thank, thank, you, thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you